Who loves Happy Black History Month? Just in time for the season, I just got my black card. And so can you. Unless you're, you're not black, then no. All right, time to put this to use. Black card, activate. Oh man, not quite. Black card, activate. Whoa, nice. Boy, am I excited to use all the benefits of my black card, such as... Hmm. I can say N Hi, I am another black person, and I'm actually offended by that term. I totally get it. All of your arguments are valid. Let's talk. Hi, I am not a black person, and I feel like... Nope, not your conversation. So culture can be divided into three parts. Cultural electives, cultural imperatives, and cultural exclusives. Cultural electives are basically anything about a culture that you're free to participate in. Let's say you're a non-black person who's finally been invited to the infamous black cookout and music starts to play. Go ahead, join, have fun, that's fine. As long as you're being respectful and not doing it in an ironic look at me way, enjoy yourself. Social dances are a huge part of black culture and it actually stems from African culture. It's a part of our culture that you're free to participate in or not, as long as you're being respectful and you're having a good time. Next are cultural imperatives. Cultural imperatives are part of a culture that it is imperative for you to participate in in order to show respect. In many African and Caribbean cultures, it is imperative that you take your shoes off when you walk in the house. We don't wear shoes in the house. That shows that you respect their house and you're not gonna attract dirt and bacteria in the house because why do people wear shoes in the house? You will get talked about and you will not get invited back. Part of my family comes from the country of Ghana. In my family, it is a faux pas to eat, shake hands, or to serve somebody with your left hand. It is culturally imperative to not use your left hand. Now for the big one, cultural exclusives. First off, every culture has cultural exclusives, but it seems like black people aren't really allowed the right to have things specifically for us. This mainly comes up in the N-word debate. If you are not black, you cannot say the N-word, nor is it your place to dictate whether or not a black person can or cannot use the N-word. That is just not your conversation. Cultural exclusive. But what if it's in the lyrics of my favorite song? No. But what if I wanna feel cool? No. In my experience, there's usually three major reasons why people wanna use the N-word. The most popular reason is usually to refer to someone or something or a situation as ignorant. And honestly, you can just say ignorant instead of the N-word. The other reason why people wanna say the N-word is because they're white supremacists and they wanna do a racism. And then there's a whole subset of non-black people who like to adopt black cultural exclusives, such as using the N-word in order to seem cool or down or hard. All that aside, I am actually super excited to finally have my black card, cause it's definitely been a long time coming. I grew up in a predominantly black suburb, but I went to school in a predominantly white, upper class, independent school located in a hidden community by a beach. Growing up in the early 2000s, black culture was defined to me as street and gangsta culture, hip hop and trap music, hyper masculinity, hypersexuality, and violence. I didn't really identify with any of that. In fact, many of my friends and I would laugh at those kids singing about gang life and street life and trapping as they walked to their single family home with a manicured lawn and multiple luxury cars in the driveway. 
I listen to rock music. I listen to grunge, pop rock, and metal, and alternative bands. My challenge was that I didn't fully identify with black culture as it was defined to me, nor did I fully identify or fit into the white culture at my school. Because I felt alienated by both African American culture and white culture, I felt the need to code switch in order to fit into both. The way that I define code switching is basically adapting your mannerisms and your style of communication in order to assimilate into the majority culture that you're in. You don't talk to your grandma and hang out with your grandma the same way that you would hang out with your friends because your grandma ain't your little friends. This is essentially the way I am off camera. This is how I communicate, this is how I talk. However, as a kid, when I was around black people, specifically the black people at my church, I felt the need to speak Ave, African American Vernacular English. African American Vernacular English is an actual language with its own grammar and its own vocabulary. The problem is that due to white supremacy, it's considered low class or improper or unprofessional. Therefore, many black Americans who speak Ave will usually do so around other black people or at home. But in environments that are predominantly white, they will speak American English. At my predominantly white school, I did not speak Ave. This was so I wouldn't stand out too much because standing out caused a lot of awkward situations for me. At school, I was often the only black kid in class. And if I came off as too black, then that would draw negative attention to me. I had a white teacher who graduated from a historically black college. In class, he would treat all the white kids like students, but then he would treat me like his homegirl. The Chappelle Show was an extremely popular show, and me and a few other black kids at the school would make references to the show all the time. My English teacher called me out on it and asked why I liked Dave Chappelle. Her argument was mainly on how Dave Chappelle would perform in whiteface. She didn't understand how that was different than white people performing in blackface. She put me in a position where I basically had to speak for all black people. Mind you, I was what? 14, 15 years old, the only black kid in class trying to explain a very loaded and complex issue to a middle-aged white woman who wasn't there to listen to anything in the first place. And it wasn't just the white people at my school. I mean, my Spanish teacher told me that she thought that my mother was dead because she always saw my father picking me up from school because in her mind, the only reason why a black father would be that involved in their child's life is if the mother was dead. To avoid these awkward moments, to avoid these microaggressions, I found myself trying to assimilate into white culture until I kind of lost my black identity completely. As I transitioned into the high school portion of my school, there were more black students. Growing up in predominantly white spaces, I witnessed black people do three main things in order to cope with the situation. The first way is by just being their authentic selves. A second way that I saw black people cope was by distancing themselves from black culture and black people. Oftentimes they will identify by whatever the majority group identifies by before identifying as black. Oftentimes this is done for survival. This is done so they're not treated differently. Now I didn't see this too much growing up at my school, but I did see this a lot at the Black Lives Matter protests that I attended last year, specifically with cops. Contrary to what you probably saw in the media, the majority of Black Lives Matter protests were actually peaceful. The ones that I attended 
we spoke to the cops. We had civil conversations with the cops. The weird part was that the cops who were engaging with us, who were talking with us, who actually kneeled with us and kneeled for us were white. Oftentimes, if a cop didn't want to talk to you or they were hesitant to kneel, they were black. The third way that I've seen black people deal with being in predominantly white spaces is by acting the polar opposite, fulfilling every single black stereotype there is. Sometimes they'll do this to delight and entertain the white people they're around, or they'll do this in order to further separate themselves from the white people they are, are around and to overcompensate for maybe not feeling secure about their black identity. Oftentimes, these are the same people who like to tell other black people that they're not black enough. They're the ones who say, oh, you're not black enough because you don't do X, Y, Z, or you don't fulfill this stereotype about black people. I remember I had a job where I was one of few black people and I had a black friend and a white friend. And together we were singing that song, This Is How We Do It by Montel Jordan. I know like the first couple of lines, you know, this is how we do it. It's Friday night, I feel all right. The party's here on the west side. And then, and then, and then. But the white girl, she continued singing the song and we found out that she knew the entire song altogether. The black girl <laughs> ended up saying, hey, Jay, she's blacker than you. Cool. I actually did feel a little insecure about it, so I did go home and try to look up the lyrics real quick, just in case I found myself in that situation again. But like, oh my God, super toxic. At my high school, there was a clique of cool black kids who essentially became the black police on campus. And as an angsty anime watching, manga reading, fan fiction writing, alternative rock music listening, gothic teenager, I did not relate to them. Honestly, they didn't like me either. Not only did I not prescribe to what they defined as blackness, I also was going through a major identity crisis trying to navigate African culture and American culture in general. You see, my father was born in Accra, Ghana, which is a country in West Africa, and my mother was born in Hartford, Connecticut. Growing up, a lot of white people would ask me why I identify as African American, and I would explain that my father is actually African and my mother is actually American, which makes me African American. But honestly, black people are free to identify as whatever they want to, whether it is African American or black American or maroon American or whatever. It's not up to non-black people to dictate how we identify ourselves. Remember, we are the descendants of Africans who were kidnapped from Africa and had their history and identity violently stolen away from them. We have spent the past century or so trying to define ourselves and you are not a part of that conversation or that debate if you are not black. It's a cultural exclusive. Mind your business. My father was my connection to my African roots. As I got older, his health started to fail due to a terminal illness called sickle cell anemia. In high school, I was desperate to hold on to my African identity. Here's the problem though. In my experience, Africans tend to look down on black people and black culture, and black people tend to not be really educated on Africans or African culture. My African father was constantly bashing black people and black culture and said, you're not black, you're African. Because I wasn't fully accepted into the black community that I was in, 
I resorted to prescribing to African culture. The problem with that was I was born and raised in America. I've only gone to Africa once. Therefore, a lot of Africans just treated me or saw me as just another black American and looked down on me. I constantly had to prove to other Africans that I was in fact African. I had to tell them that my father's Ghanaian, I was born into the royal family of the Ashanti tribe, and I was named after two queen mothers. As I've gotten older and I've met a more diverse group of people, specifically a more diverse group of black people, I've realized that I am enough. I am black enough, I am African enough, just by being me. To all those kids who grew up in predominantly white spaces, who maybe went to a white school or a white college, or for black people who are the only black person at their job, your experience is a part of the black experience and it's just as valid as anyone else's. And for those first, second generation American children, you are just as much a part of your family's heritage as anyone else. Growing up, it seemed like black culture was defined for me by the media. And who owns the media? The wealthy elite. Of course, the wealthy elite want us to chase the latest cool fashion trends and spend all our money trying to look cool or look black. They're going to portray people in poverty as criminals so they can criminalize the poor. The more that they can promote the subjugation of women, the more that they can oppress half of the American population. We are not a monolith. And it feels like it wasn't until the advent of social media and us having the ability to control our identity that we've been able to fully not only prove this, but embrace this. In the Ashanti tribe, we have an Adinkra symbol that means unity through diversity. The sentiment is needed in the Black community more than ever. As we continue our civil rights movement, as we face white supremacy, it is important for us to honor, value, and respect all Black perspectives and all Black experiences in order to stay unified, in order to stay strong, in order to embrace the fact that all Black lives matter. Speaking of all Black lives mattering, next week's episode is Black History is So Gay. If you are watching this on YouTube, please be sure to like and subscribe in order to be the first one to be notified about our next episode. And remember, as always, wherever you are on your journey, I am so very proud of you. And remember, I love you. Peace.